Welcome back to Navigating Netflix, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. We are joined by our old buddy, Jay Dyer. It's been about a year and a half, I think, since you and I talked. We talked about Interstellar, I believe, when it was first out. So it's good to talk to you again, buddy. We did, uh, yes. That one analysis has made me a multimillionaire with millions of fans, and I'm the biggest website in the world now. So it's been a great year. Thank you for promoting it. It was all due to James M. Pilato. People really do win when they play Media Monarchy. <laughs> hey, man. So Navigating Netflix was created by Rich and Lisa at Tragedy and Hope. And they've been running this group within the community for several years now. And it's basically a spot where people post up things that they're watching that they think maybe has worth or things that everybody is watching with a different you know, context or subtext to it. And I, I got really into it, and we started to kind of make a show out of it. And we've made a few different episodes in a few different formats, but I've been making these episodes for just MediaMonarchy.com, where I have someone from the Tragedy and Hope community, and you are in there as well. And I was happy to see you kind of showing up more and more there on the email list and things. And again, congrats to Rich and Lisa on their new child, I should mention. But how did you actually get involved with Tragedy and Hope? Well, I'm both a tragic and a hopeful person. I'm a, I'm a case of tragedy and a case of hope. Uh, no, I I, uh, I think I heard uh, it mentioned on Alex Jones four or five years ago, and I thought, well, that sounds interesting, and I was familiar with the book. I had not read it th at that point, but um, I thought, well, that's actually a good idea to name the site after that pretty seminal geopolitical mm -hmm. tome. Of Carol Quigley, and uh, I had a good buddy who was a comic book artist, the guy who drew uh, the Game of Thrones series, mm -hmm. who's very active, and he he'd been in the group for a few years, and as a member, and said, "Hey, you need to get on over there." And I kept putting it off just for being busy, and then uh, I think Richard uh, emailed me, and then <clears throat> talked to people like Tim Kelly, and uh, uh, did an interview with James Corbett, um, and talked to Kevin Cole and some other people and so eventually yeah, I just uh, made my way on over there and with varying degrees of uh, activity have been, you know you know how it is you get busy but uh, but yeah I benefited a lot from Tragedy and Hope and uh, it was Tragedy and Hope that spurred me to actually read the book hmm. which you know is very important so I've learned a tremendous amount from uh, everybody there and uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm excited to be talking Navigating Netflix. I haven't spent much time in that arena of Tragedy and Hope, but, but uh, here I am now as the golden child star of it. <laughs> there you are. Well, you're following in the footsteps. We had, you, we see had, this, uh, you see this halo right here, the, the way the light is. It's, you can see and I'm, and I'm, I'm very dark. <laughs> we have the, uh, we're the two sides of the self here on this oh, episode. It's like dialectic masonry, the floor <laughs> patterns. Of hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're, you're getting ahead of us. <laughs> So, and and actually, it should be said, navigating Netflix, the name shouldn't necessarily be taken too literally. And I'll ask you about that a little bit at the end of this conversation. But it's basically a place to talk about film or shows or any kind of motion pictures that we want to look at. And we've looked at The Experiment and Idiocracy and It's a Wonderful Life. And last month, we talked about the Hunger Games series. We talked about House of Cards as well. We're here, and actually, I just kind of asked you on Twitter straight up, and you said, absolutely, if you want to talk about the revival of the X-Files. Now, I'll make the <laughs> silly, you know, bad joke and say, the truth is, I haven't oh. watched all six episodes of the revival. Oh, you said the revival. truth is out there. <laughs> well, no, the I didn't. Is, I, I didn't, haven't watched it. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> you know... I'll include in the show notes, I was listening to it again before you and I got on the line here. One of my favorite bands, Spiritualized, has as a B-side, they do a cover of the X-Files wow. theme, and they do it really, really well. We can't include it on here, but we'll put it in the show notes so people can, can check it out later. So, the X-Files, after many, many years, returned to Fox and ran for six episodes, and they ran back in January and February of this year, 2016, and they had made a film a couple of years ago, but basically it's X-Files now for post 9-11. And the timeline was a little fuzzy for me. And again, we'll include the links here and you can just read the straight up breakdown on Wikipedia about the episode list. 
But the original run of X-Files actually did go past 9-11, and their final, at that point, ninth season hit the air in November of 2001. But, of course, all those episodes were, for the most part, probably written and produced in the can, so to speak. So it didn't really, you know, it didn't have 9-11 in its world. And now the X-Files comes back, and a lot of the takes I've kind of seen, and again, I've got an article here from The Guardian I'll mention in a minute, that it is, it's it's X-Files for the post-9-11 world, and it takes in all the sort of, the elements that we're seeing now, even compared to kind of when it, it hit the air. So I know you've got a bit of notes there about the show. What is it that maybe immediately struck you about the X-Files revival? Well, I was I had a mediocre level of uh, anticipation. I am a big X-Files fan. I think that when I was really digging into conspiracy theory stuff eight, nine years ago, I was starting to get into the X-Files. So it, it dawned on me, you know, that, hey, there's TV shows actually about conspiracy theories because uh, I, for most of my 20s, I didn't watch TV. So I, I was busy with uh, these books here. And since then, I've kind of gotten back into watching a lot of film and, and television. And so that was one of the shows in my 20s that I was really into. So I actually watched the show, you know, like a decade after it was gone. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's... <clears throat> It's interesting because it's sort of sanitized conspiracy theory, obviously. It's, it's conspiracy theory for the pop audience, UFO, alien crap. Um, but it's a lot of fun. You know, it's just entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, it does, of course, include quite a bit of, I guess, what we could call revelation of the method. And I'm sure many people will probably be familiar with the you know pre-9-11 events of the spinoff series, The Lone Gunman, where you have you know the hijacked uh, remote-controlled jets being flown into the towers and so forth. Uh, but the series as a whole, which I've watched the first uh, nine seasons all the way through twice, uh, there's quite a bit in those too. Uh, you know, I don't want to launch too far into that, but you know, just off the top of my head, what comes to mind is things like. Uh, the engineering of cancer uh, by genetic modification. Of course, it's sheltered under the umbrella of aliens, uh-huh. uh, which I don't believe in aliens. But uh, it is interesting that you do have an establishment that was run by the syndicate, which uh, represents kind of a cooperation of government and corporate forces together. This elite shadowy smoky room click run by persons like the cigarette smoky man who as I understand, is actually based on the character of E. Howard Hunt. So the real-life uh, Watergate, mm-hmm. JFK, Don <laughs> of the CIA conspiracy world uh, is supposed to be the uh, the basis for the character of the cigarette smoking man. Uh, they're sort of running the you – know, that's the cabal, that's the Illuminati for better, for mm-hmm. lack of better terms. Um, and so, you know, you'll have – this the overarching storyline, the story arc about the aliens and Mulder's past and Mulder's sister and all that, and then you'll have all the monsters of the week episodes, mm-hmm. and then every now and then you'll have these strange episodes that deal with something very real, like uh, uh, you know pre nine eleven signifiers, terror attacks. You'll have uh, uh, biological attacks. Uh, you'll have false flags. Uh, for example, the um, the first X Files movie. I think it's nineteen ninety. 98. Any, okay, 98. Yeah. Uh, that includes a large scale terror attack on a government building that kind of looks reminiscent of either the Oklahoma City bombing or, mm. or perhaps a, a, a hint towards 9 11. I don't know. But uh, I've always found that aspect of, it, of the uh, movie interesting. I have a um, an X Files novel uh, that was not. Probably not very well known. It's around here somewhere. I could, I should probably pull it out because it's relevant. It uh, speaks of. It's called Ground Zero, ah. and this is the book was printed prior to 9/11, and it is the storyline of the novel revolves around a large scale terror attack, Ground Zero. And it's a, like an officially sanctioned X Files. It's right here. Let me pull it out. Huh. Can you, uh, there I it is. Can see it. Yeah. 
Yes. And uh, Ground Zero was published in 1995. Oh, nice. Huh. So... <clears throat> My suspicion, and of course, if you've seen the interviews that, for example, Dean Haglin, one of the lone gunmen, uh, has done with mm -hmm. Alex Jones from some years ago, right, right around 2002 or three, I think, somewhere in there, you know, he was very candid about the fact that the CIA was involved in the scripting of this show. So, uh, you know, at the time that I heard that, that was very shocking to me. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, it's 10 years, 12, 13, 14, 15 years later. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So that's how we we're going to have the pr predictive programming, the, the pre-scripting, the, the foreshadowing of the events of 9-11 and so forth. And so <clears throat> to get to the new series, season 10, more of the same. Uh, we have that same tendency to, to reveal things in this popular culture form. But what surprised me the most about the new season was the degree to which we had references to very real things. It is, of course, still sanitized, watered down, and put under the umbrella of aliens, but it's X-Files, what do you expect? But, uh, I mean, I've got quite a bit of stuff that's, <laughs> that was surprisingly listed here. So, as we said, the cigarette smoking man is back. Um, we have, right away, genetic experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, GMOs and all that, which that was all in the first nine seasons, but what specifically comes up is eugenics. And so mm -hmm. eugenics is mentioned uh, in concert with the genetic experimentation and the... At a, at a company called Nugenics. Nugenics, correct, right. And uh, there's references to human trafficking. We have references to baby mills, where babies are being abducted for such purposes. Mm -hmm. That was kind of actually in the, the first nine seasons, but... Uh, a lot more is packed into these uh, six or how many? It was a six or seven episodes. Six, I can't six. six. Um, and yeah. I heard references to you know uh, explicit references to Snowden. Yes. To Obamacare, NSA. even actually, even specifically too. They he he sort of in trying to trick this uh, a nurse in a particular scene mentions Obamacare as the reason for why the feds are there to investigate. Yeah, 9-11 is said to be a false flag. So you have Joe Mc Joel McHale is playing mm -hmm. this sort of crossover between, I guess, Glenn Beck and maybe Alex Jones. Uh -huh. And he's this very successful online conspiracy theorist. Uh, who, I guess he's kind of the replacement for the lone gunman. In the original nine mm -hmm. seasons, the lone gunman were these three guys who ran this kind of underground yeah. publication. Sort of like uh, Mel Gibson's character in the movie Conspiracy Theory. He's got well, and I think that's the, and this is actually one of the main points that the, this Guardian article I'll include in the show notes sort of says, of course the X-Files is back now because right now, and especially as we're leading into the presidential selection, it's an exact mirror of 92 and it's malicious and it's homegrown terror and it's, and in, in a way it is that update because in the 90s, well, it was... It had to be newsletters and mimeographed things. But now, you know, oh, no, now we have podcasts and, and the Internet. But it's basically they kind of updated that voice for the exactly. show. For the show. Exactly. And, yeah, the climate is very similar, right? I mean, we got – but I think of the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, the late, late 80s, early 90s, I think of Robin Leach and Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, I think of Lifestyles of the Rich and <laughs> Famous uh -huh. with Robin Leach, right? And then Donald Trump being on there and Donald Trump in the news for casinos going under and he's going broke and all this stuff. And then we have Clinton versus Bush and uh, then into the early 90s, Clinton's, Clinton's, Clinton's. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, very similar. So in Hollywood, interestingly, is sort of reflecting this where uh, there's so much of what comes out is just rehash and remake, reboot. Mm -hmm. You know, everything, it, it, 80s and 90s is just packed with nothing but now reboots. So it's everything from, you know, a new season of Full House to yeah. uh, Return of the X-Files to another Ghostbusters. I mean, Gil it's, it's Gilmore kind of sad, Girls. So I think it shows the intellectual creative creative bankruptcy, you know, of Hollywood. It but, does. Um, and... and and it's a, even just kind of a numbers. It's an easy numbers thing for them too. Like, we own the rights to all those shows. 
all the companies have been consolidated now into three places so those three places can just crank out stuff uh they just they just announced they might make a heathers tv show if you remember the movie heathers oh, I do. yeah the uh, <laughs> uh went on a uh went yep. on a rider and yep. um uh, Christian Slater. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have to save that for a, a, a future episode of this. <laughs> for right now, we're talking about the 10th yeah, season. Yeah, I didn't mean to get off, but I was no. saying what, what, I, what, what you were making that point about the the show is reflect, the new season is reflecting the atmosphere of kind of the era of the X-Files updated. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, so we have free energy comes up, which is interesting because that's a, uh, something very popular in you know the conspiracy world we have still the references to the old old hat stuff like roswell but Mulder makes a curious statement that he once again thinks he's been lied to right so roswell aliens it was all a cover and the real plan he comes to believe is what joel McHale's character is saying the truth squad guy uh, is that the elite intend to depopulate the earth through the use of chemtrails genetic modification to achieve uh, eugenic dominance so everything is now uh, grouped under the meta conspiracy right and Mm -hmm. this is what at least in the first couple episodes Mulder comes to believe is the case and so this includes as you mentioned everything from the NSA to the NDAA Uh, it includes a police state the big pharmaceutical companies, social engineering, and in, uh, Joel McHale even speaks of a great culling, right? <laughs> hmm. So uh, this will result in a mass collapse of civilization uh, due to an electromagnetic pulse. Uh, then there will be a fake war that's blamed on Russia, World War Three. So they're sort of uh, throwing some nods, I guess, to the preppers. And this is all being run by the same syndicate. So Mulder believes he's solved all of this. And then, of course, there's the obligatory drama between Mulder and Scully over the kid they had, William. Mm-hmm. And they tried to pick up that storyline of William, which was, I think was ultimately pretty retarded because this is supposed to tie into the super soldier theme that was part of seasons eight and nine, where their son is, unbeknownst to them, a part of this super soldier program. Mm-hmm. And so he's got these abilities and there's, Gifted children with superpowers. Well, and X, I think the X Men kids. Right? And you're almost X-Files, like X-Men. kind of hitting on that it is overstuffed yeah. in a lot of ways, and it's kind of this big conspiracy stew. And yes. I yeah. think even sort of critically, I think when people first got a you know first taste of the show, you know we're all there's that excitement to it. And yeah, then it's I almost, think it's like uh, you know did uh, Chris Carter just go to before it's news and pick the top 10 <laughs> articles from before it's news and that's okay, it. Well, here's the top 10 conspiracies so you know put all this in there for some candy or some conspiracy candy but it maybe almost hits the point too that and i've i've tried to kind of say this on the show before that it's like mainstream culture ate conspiracy culture and it's mm-hmm. now just sort of part of the big it mess is. of oh i've heard of illuminati before and yeah, and Kanye, and it's just kind of a, it's all, a, it doesn't really make any coherent sense into anyone, it's just another phrase, catchphrase, tr- like, it's just part of the big mess, and in some ways it's part of the info overload of, of yes. all of it. So the methods have been revealed, but there's, you know, kind of no sense you can make of it in, in a That's lot a of ways. That's a good point, yeah, it doesn't really... And that was one of the major uh, drawbacks of the conclusion of the season. I don't want to, I can't spoil it for you with any spoilers because it's unresolved. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no danger of me spoiling anything because they don't resolve the, the story arc of season 10. So it's left open. It's left open. Uh, you know, Jillian Anderson says, I don't know if I even want to do another season. Um, I don't know if that's uh, BS propaganda or what, but. Um, <clears throat> There is, there are some more uh, aspects that interestingly are mentioned in the uh, third and fourth episodes. Uh, it's episode, I think, five in my notes, or the finale that really ramps up the uh, the conspiracy stuff. So what you have with, with episode three and four is a, a little more of the uh, 
monster of the week theme that we would get in the early X Files seasons, particularly seasons one and two, you get the monster of the week. And, and don't uh, a couple of comedians, does uh, Kamel Nanjani, a guy shows up, I think, in episode three. So in a way, that even sort of you, like you know, then on its face, it's like, oh, well, this that episode's going to have a little more levity to it. Exactly, and 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 in the you know the uh, previous nine seasons, you would get a comedic episode every say ten or so. Mm-hmm. You would have a comedy uh, based episode, and that's what we get in, in episode three is the uh, lizard guy, and there, there's a lot of interesting philosophical commentary on uh, Darwinism and Darwinian theory mm-hmm. and natural selection, and but it's all kind of put into the satirical approach to horror. Uh, oh, okay. So you have basically. Because the X-Files was known for the Monster of the Week, they've combined all of the tropes of the horror monster genre and even sort of the cheeseball 50s version of that creature mm-hmm. from the Black Lagoon into one episode that's pretty funny uh, and is also somewhat philosophical. Because M- Mulder's in the midst of pondering a lot of these philosophical questions and he's having these philosophical debates with this uh, uh the the uh, comedian from uh, Flight of the Concords, uh, his name escapes me. The guy from New Zealand, but oh uh, really? He's in there too. Yeah, and nice. so they're having these debates over uh, you know <laughs> what, what is it to be human? What is it to be natural? What is it to be free? What is it to be determined by nature? The survival of the fittest. Um, and that, those are I, even though the the episode uh, ultimately kind of has a pro Darwinian perspective, and I don't mean to do, the you know fall off into a big big debate about that i i'm not a, a darwinian so I, I found it very interesting that they were actually raising interesting questions that i would raise about darwinianism because mm. one of the questions would be what is it to be human as opposed to just another animal are humans merely animals mm-hmm. right and this is a kind of a funny exchange that he has with Mulder. so uh, that was an enjoyable, fun episode. There was, but nothing too conspiratorial in that. Then, with episode four, we have another version of the monster of the week, but it takes a different turn with referencing some pretty esoteric stuff. And although, if you if we went back to the old episodes, you would find um, things like the Sizigi mentioned with uh, the satanic cult elements in a few episodes. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a whole lot of. I can't think of any references to Blavatsky or philosophy or theosophy, but that's what we have in the fourth episode, in in the midst of a monster of the week episode where Mulder talks about thought forms and the possibility mm-hmm. of a group of people energetically uh, causing something to occur in the psychosphere or the spiritual realm or whatever based on, uh, well, the thought form. And so Theosophy is mentioned, and I won't go too much into the monster of that episode, because it's, kind of, it's all, it's, I, I, I'm not sure if it's satire or <laughs> what exactly they're saying in that episode, because it's it's the trash can man. Hmm. <laughs> but it all takes place within the theme of HUD. And if you are familiar with, say, Catherine Austin Fitz's work on you mean the, the housing and urban, urban development? Housing and urban okay. development. And her presentation is that that was a lot of scamming and black books. And, and this was the gentrification is actually a part of the process of moving towards sustainable development, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> which she argues that in different places. But uh, so, <laughs> so you have all this, you have this stuff about HUD. And corruption related to HUD and gentrification, and this is literally referenced in the episode, in the midst of references to theosophy and thought forms and Blavatsky. So, I mean, this that one was just hmm. out there. I don't know how else to... I mean, it's interesting it's so out there. But, uh, you know, Mulder says that he thinks that we can draw the dead to us through the creation of certain thought forms. So, you make of that what you will. That's actually That's something uh, Clyde Lewis of Ground Zero actually would cover a lot. This thought forms. I, I, I work. I was the producer of, of Ground Zero for about a year and a half, and that was that was a, a, a common theme that we discussed there. Well, uh, just a little side note: uh, in Orthodox Christian uh, theology, you have a famous three-volume work that's called the Philokalia, 
And what this is, is it's kind of a translation of the monastic wisdom and thought from uh, several centuries of uh, Eastern Christianity. And they have uh, a pretty worked out doctrine of this as well, believe it or not. So if you hmm. like, if you look at, say, Mount Athos, which is in Greece, and you have the famous monasteries on Mount Athos, which is an island that women are not allowed to set foot on, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, the, the, the monastic text, the Philokalia, has uh, sections that discuss the logismoi. And in the Greek, that is the same idea as the thought form. Just a hmm. side note, I thought people might find interesting. So, then we move up to the finale. Uh, I don't want to. I mean, I'm rambling. I'd break in if you want to say. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I want too fast or too slow. No, I want thumbnail of that uh, of the of the finale. If, if because as you said, if you can even kind of call it the finale. Yeah. So we're back to all this alien DNA baby testing stuff. Um, and there's gross the, stuff too. There's lots of deformities. Yeah. I found there was a couple of moments where I was like, I'm, well, actually, they almost yeah, looked a, like a, a you know depleted uranium, like birth defect, gross stuff. Well, throughout the entirety of this season ten, it's really gross. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know yuck, gross out stuff. But there's an interesting statement. I, don't, I forget who says it. Maybe Mul- It's maybe Scully even says it. Um, so we're back to Scully having doubts about her religious beliefs and faith. Um, and there's, there was also an interesting juxtaposition where throughout the series, generally speaking, everybody knows Scully was the rationalist and was always, you know, Mulder, we got to be scientific, we got to be rational. Mulder is the woo-woo, you know, out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, But there's an interesting thing where it flips. So in, in episode uh, four, five, and six, somewhere in there, there's a flip where Mulder starts saying, you know, I've been wrong. It's it's reason. It's rationality. You're right. And then Scully's, no, Mulder, you were right all along. It's actually, you know, spirits and whatnot. And I've seen ghosts now. I saw my dead mom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so I believe that Scully says, how can we have justice in a purely science-based world that question is Hmm. raised and i think that's a great question and so if we were to find some redeeming aspects of the new series of the x-files that is one of the questions that that arises that i highlight in a lot of my talks and works is when we have the presuppositions of scientism um, which is an outgrowth of the enlightenment and particularly of darwinian philosophy how can we have a sense of what is just? I mean, if man is just another uh, manifestation of the biochemical world, which in itself doesn't have any meaning, he's just another animal, then life is just as meaningless as nothingness, right? So how, how can, in the midst of that, can we find some standard of object, objective justice or morals or um, uh, meaning or ways of living or whatever? Uh, so that's an interesting question. And and when you look at the history, particularly of the 20th century, in terms of genetic experimentation, uh, you know, experiments on humans, uh, the military conducting biowarfare, experimentation even on its own citizens in the U.S., mm-hmm. uh, that's precisely where we're led. We look at Alfred Kinsey, uh, you know, the molestation of children through scientific uh, experimentation. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, across the board, look at MK Ultra, the the uh, mind control that was uh, uh, through Dr. Ewan Cameron actually engaged in, you know, pretty egregious violations of what most people would consider as human rights. Mm-hmm. That's a, a great question. You know, well, how can we have justice in this? I would not use the word science because I believe in science. I'm very much pro science, but not scientism. So that's an interesting critique that that was made. Mm-hmm. Um, Scully, we find out, has uh, alien DNA. That's no surprise. That was actually revealed in the previous nine seasons. Uh, Tad O'Malley, the, the Joel McHale character, reiterates the ultimate conspiracy. So now we have a grand unified field <laughs> conspiracy theory uh, that uh, is, I think, supposed to tie in all the previous conspiracies of, of the first nine seasons. And we're back to pans- uh, panspermia. Uh, which is weird because that was hinted at throughout the first nine seasons. Mm-hmm. And this, the idea of the engineers, if you saw Prometheus, then you, you're familiar mm-hmm. with the idea of the, the alien engineers and that we're, we were created by 
these uh, sort of archon uh, higher evolved alien beings. That's why we have DNA that it such as it is, and it's kind of similar to the aliens. So I mean, that's kind of like straight out of Prometheus, in my view. But but that's an actual view. I mean, this is what Stephen Hawking. This is what Francis Crick. You know, important scientists, mm-hmm. so so called. Uh, you know, really do believe in panspermia. Richard Dawkins has said that panspermia uh, is a more viable belief system than creation. I'm not sure why it would be more. It's easier to believe in aliens than a god, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> interesting, though, vaccines play a big role in the finale. And vaccines are explicitly, it's almost like everything dawns on Scully in the finale. And she realizes that even though she's been the perennial skeptic, oh, there really is a big uh-huh. conspiracy. And they really are wanting to depopulate. And they're going to release this plague through vaccines. Mm. It's a, a mass bioweapon, but it's not a mass bioweapon that's going to attack through the air. There's statements about it being through vaccination. So there there are some nods to the possibility of Ebola, which I think was a bit ridiculous because if we look to last year's Ebola scare, uh, that was all a completely a, me- a media creation. There was no Ebola outbreak. <clears throat> But there, uh, there are references again to you know, the early seasons with the bees and the GMO. Uh-huh. And that was designed to uh, give the population cancer on a mass scale. So, well, I wonder if this will be the, the, the kind of case where we'll we'll have to look twenty twenty back at X Files then when oh they talked about these they talked about these events and we'll sort of pick through the clues kind of after the fact maybe because right. it kind of strikes me as though in a lot of ways that it, it's a cash grab it's a it's a franchise sort sure. of exploitation and that i wonder if they have anything really new to to say in in a lot of ways and that it is sort of that that kind That's of you know kind of that yeah, but, that stew. Yeah. yeah, if you're in, if you're writing an X Files episode, you're already determined. Uh huh. <laughs> you're already bound by <laughs> the fact that you're going to be writing an X Files episode. So you got to have the aliens. You got to have the ghost. The, you know. And yeah, you I was have actually all the, all the tropes. I was kind of struck with in what I've seen of this, of the revival episode, some of it is like kind of bad writing, kind of stilted at times. And there seems like there are lots of moments of like, Oh really? You mean exposition and explain the thing that you already showed me. There's a lot of sort of don't, don't tell you already showed me like I'm watching the show. You don't have to beat me over the head and sort of that. It's those things that remind me. Oh, that's right. I'm watching a fucking TV show. Well, you know, we've seen that more and more. I think with film and, and television and the arts as a whole are becoming dumbed down. And so you see that quite often where, where it, the, what you're watching insults your intelligence by, by explaining the thing that you just watched. So absolutely. I, I wish I would add, too, that in the finale, it's also mentioned again that chemtrails are the means by which mm. the DNA tampering is happening to the human populace. And this is spoken of as the end game of the syndicate. So, of course, Mulder has yet another showdown with the cigarette smoking man, but it doesn't go anywhere because the finale leaves us hanging. Also interesting that it's uh, spoke. I think they call it this. It's called the Spartan virus because it breaks mm-hmm. out in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and it's spoken of as a binary weapon that is not just triggered through chemtrails and the vaccines but also through electromagnetic weaponry Hmm. so there's the cell towers i guess it doesn't really explain it's almost like they just you know let's put every single possible Uh conspiracy in here and i would look at that and go well okay so that means that if we didn't get you with the with the vaccines or the chemtrails well we'll just blow the shit out of you with your with your smartphone smartphone exactly and i felt like the second episode 
has a lot of that sort of it's got the loud noise and it's got the scanners i i kept waiting for someone's head to explode that's a great point yeah i forgot about that with the uh frequency that uh, was disrupting people. and that's another it's sort of that's that's that sort of targeted you know gang stalking and and electronic harassment another you know another element in the conspiracy I, I world world conspiracy. yeah don't forget too uh the episode three or four but the one where they have the muslim terror attack that was actually uh well it's not actually the guy who's doing its fault so kind of a false flag but not really. mm-hmm. sort of uh but uh, in that episode there's a lot of uh, as you mentioned i think that's more where they reference obamacare and one of the nurses says something to the effect of i gotta kill him because he's an immigrant and uh, the you know isis is coming across the border and they're gonna take us over and uh you know this is all because obama uh, is a muslim or uh, something to that effect is referenced which is actually a fake conspiracy theory in my view i don't believe Barack Obama is a Muslim who wants ISIS to cross the border. Well, and that may be kind of kind of brings us full circle in a way because it sort of it seems whether by design or just by the luck of media production schedules sometimes that it is a sort of update for the new kind of divide and conquer that we're seeing because as i kind of referenced earlier the 90s were very much a time of you know militias and racists and sort of a a home feeling of of civil war and i've i've often contended on media monarchy that those are the sort of the fake games that you see when the phony left is in power we all have to fight each other because the enemy's here but then when the phony time of yeah you're absolutely right that was the time of tim mcveigh and tim mcveigh was of course Yep, recruited sheep dipped into black ops, and then he's part of this Elohim City connection, this this right wing racial militia, which is all kind of run by the feds. Mm-hmm. So yep. absolutely, and which is back in the news again with this new Supreme Court nomination, Garland. So again, no, it's it's all part of the stew that we're kind of swimming in. in well, I just the world. had another uh, Ruby Ridge scenario. Uh, you know, we had back in the nineties. Uh, which one of the um, I always get the, uh, the, the, well, we had Waco, right? Mm-hmm. And then we had, uh, was it Ruby Ridge? Waco, the, Ruby Ridge, yeah, and then Oklahoma and Now City. we got the Oregon standoff, the yep. Bundy thing. That's kind of a recycling yep. of that uh, uh, danger, supposedly, of the militias mm-hmm. everywhere. And that's, the, I so, mean, and that gets, uh, that's where I sort of look off and go, oh, God, are we, we do just imitate this were so easily led and the TV made me mad at that guy. So so I can no wonder everybody's beating the shit out of each other and we're all losing it. Everybody's kind of sick and really susceptible to to contagions. That's why I always like Lauren Coleman's work. He doesn't necessarily well, take a stand on why, but it's, there's just the sort of the echo chamber copycat effect of, of all of it. So I think that's in a way why the X-Files returning it is very timely, fortuitously, in, in uh, at least in their case. As well as Twin Peaks. <laughs> Twin Peaks will be back next year. There you Another go. Another late 80s, 90s uh, phenomenon. So mm-hmm. um, they, we only have one hope, though, James, and that is that when Saved by the Bell comes back, <laughs> we can all learn to live together. <laughs> who, who would have ever thought that uh, that Mario Lopez would, would be the one that now still in 2016 is like, He's wildly successful Still on TV, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a good point. So we have been talking to Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. He was nice enough to come on and talk about the X-Files revival. And as we wrap this episode up of Navigating Netflix, I've kind of noted and been talking about it on my shows and things and kind of realizing maybe the name Navigating Netflix might not work for the show anymore and it might be too specific. Because I think in a lot of ways when... Rich and Lisa started the chat and or started the group rather. Netflix was the thing we all streamed on, but now there's Hulu and Amazon and on demand and all these different ways. And I don't actually want to scare people off by seeing a name and going, I don't have Netflix. So let me pose to you, put you on the spot. I have a couple of maybe one really that I'm thinking about a different name idea instead of navigating Netflix. What do you think about deep focus?
Uh, not bad, but every time I hear Deep, the first thing I think of is Deep Impact. Oh. I or like deep, it because it's deep. a film reference. The cinematographer, Greg Toland, and that was the a sort of technique he pioneered early on in like Citizen Kane and Battleship Potemkin. I've got a better one. This week in Laserdisc. <laughs> it's, we just do this monthly right now, so... <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll, no, deep focus isn't bad. I'm, I'm okay. being silly. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'll I'll still plant that seed with you, and if you if it comes to you, go. Oh, I, this, I can think of a great uh, This one asshole does uh, esoteric Hollywood. You could do something like that. <laughs> well, and there's this other guy who does film literature and New World Order. Like all the good titles yeah. are already taken by all the better analysts than I am. So that actually brings us to Esoteric Hollywood. How has it been going in your own pursuits on jaysanalysis.com? Because you and I both kind of quit our day jobs to make indie media. Uh, it's going great. I'm having a blast doing it. Um, it's it's successful. I, mean, I feel like Donald Trump. Like, it's going great. It's wonderful. Everything's going to be great. We're doing what it's going to We're going to make Jay's analysis great again, okay? <laughs> Thank you. It's wonderful people. You're great, James. I love you. No, it's, uh, it's going well. Um, the book will be out in June. Uh, I'm doing the uh, touch-ups on the manuscript and uh, the show, uh, Jay's Analysis, and uh, Esoteric Hollywood is doing well as, uh, also. So you can check that out at jaysanalysis.com. And um, if you like what you hear and you like what I'm saying, uh, help me out and subscribe. So I always need subscribers. Um, I do philosophy lectures uh, once a week, as well as interviews that deal with mm -hmm everything geopolitics philosophy film esoteric you name it so uh yeah uh, absolutely thumbs up to me <laughs> well absolutely thumbs up to you and, I, and again i appreciate you coming and on here and you. and and hopefully this will not be the last time you'll appear here on the still called navigating netflix possibly to be name changed show where we talk about motion pictures that are worth spending your time watching if you're gonna watch anything i feel like if you're gonna listen to anything why don't you do it in a thoughtful way i know i always kind of got mad and you know of course a huge music fan as well the idea that jazz and classical are the only types of music that are worth you know thinking and speaking thoughtfully about and i think i've kind of tried to work most of my life of looking at other areas in a thoughtful way that it's not just some throwaway popcorn thing because if it's going to be something that we're, i mean we're all listening to music we're all watching stuff we might all put up you know bits of fronts of like oh no i killed my television and in a lot of ways we have which is why we're doing this here but i think if we're going to be doing it we may as well do it i think kind might of in well a talk about it right in a, in a in a more kind of thoughtful way and you know some people think it might not be fun to watch shows with a you know pen and pencil and pausing it and taking notes and but that's it is I assure you it is I, I love it I before. love it so my final question to you as we wrap up if you have any suggestions of something that we might talk about next month on this show with with a different guest what what shows what films what other things are kind of popping around to you whether they are new or old things that you've you've kind of been thinking about. It's a lot of on-the-spot questions for you. No, that's great. Um, I, uh, I'm going to do an analysis of the Alien series uh, because those are mm. seminal sci-fi slash horror films. And of course, obviously, the first and second are the most blockbustery mm -hmm. because the other ones were not so well critically received, although they did make money. Uh, and we will also get sequels, not just to Prometheus, but also to the original Alien series. There will be a sequel to that, supposedly, in the next year or two. So I think that's going to be, um, again, you know, something people are talking about, since you're going to get two more Alien movies uh, in the next couple of years. And I went back and watched all of them. And even though we might, you might be tempted to think, well, it's just an it's just a horror movie. It's just alien. No, there's actually quite a bit of references to philosophy, references to God, uh, to the idea of technology, of um, genetic modification. Very important. All of those things are relevant to the Alien series, uh, and I don't just my personal taste. I, I think Ridley Scott has made a bunch of bad movies lately. Uh huh. I didn't even care for the for Prometheus. I didn't think it was that good of a movie, but people are going to be watching it, and so it's worth talking about. Um, 
but he he was really good early on. So I think that mm -hmm. Alien One is a seminal film. It's very well made, um, and also a lot of feminism there too. And so we've seen this trend in film of the evolution of the woman. So if you saw Gravity uh, with Sandra Bullock, mm -hmm. that was very much the plot of Gravity, mm -hmm. where she comes back to Earth, and there's there's constant references to evolution and the idea of well maybe the male throughout history if you believe in evolution has been the dominant species or the dominant half of the species but perhaps through evolution the woman could be the new man so to speak to use the Marxist mm -hmm. terminology or the uh, Nietzschean terminology the Ubermensch. And is that kind of hit on in the new Mad Max? It is. Okay. You are absolutely right. And that's also when I watched Alien, that's what happens in the Alien series. Ripley goes from being a somewhat passive feminine woman with long hair to, by the end of the series, a bald uh, assassin <laughs> who mm -hmm. more and more begins to side with the completely calculating predatory mm -hmm. xenomorphs. And then, of course, in Alien Resurrection, she's a clone who uh -huh. comes back, and she's uh, a super soldier, basically. So she's beyond good and evil, very much like the Xenomorph, because she's part Xenomorph. So interesting uh, theory of what resurrection means. So what really Scott and the d different directors mm -hmm. and writers mm -hmm. have done is taken the religious ideas of resurrection and so forth, and transmuted them into a scientific, scientistic sense of cloning, genetic modification, and so forth. Nice. There's a sneak preview of Esoteric Hollywood tucked inside an episode of Navigating Netflix. And I actually, I was one of the 14 people that saw Alien 3 in a theater when it came out. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> the prison and, colony, yeah. And then years later, what did we realize? Oh shit, David Fincher made that. Yeah, he did. Right. So you've got Ridley Scott, and then you've got James Cameron, and then you've got David Fincher. So they've, they've selected you know prominent directors. Mm -hmm. And then with uh, Alien Resurrection, you had uh, Jean uh, Dujon, whatever the French guy's oh, yeah. name it, that did uh, City of Lost Children. Delicatessen, and yeah. Yeah, and Delicatessen. And, and I think it's a good... Uh, it's not the best movie, but it's not bad. And uh, his directing is very good. And it's packed with you know a good bit of philosophy and uh, predictive programming and even though we like to I like to go back and mine films like that for these topics I had completely forgotten Alien Resurrection <laughs> I, mean, I just mm -hmm. forgotten that movie and mm -hmm. then so I was like oh crap there's, uh, you know, this is full of stuff I keep having people recommend Mr. Robot I don't know if you've watched that or heard of that that's kind uh, of a, a buzzy I kind of recommend it but I've not seen it okay but. That's one I kind of hear that that should be watched, and it and it seems like it's one of the like it's kind of a smart show, and it has good good kind of buzz and marketing to it. Clever. Um, did you did you ever see the Prisoner? The the original series. Uh -huh. I've never sat down and watched it end to end, but I am I am familiar with it. Okay, and that actually yeah, well, you can sort of watch it out boring. of order. Or there's a yeah, certain it's way, hard, yeah. and some people find it a little tedious and boring because it's kind of that slow British style yeah. of drama. But uh, I, there's full, a lot of uh, espionage, es esoteric, uh, you know, all philosophy all wrapped up into that. Um, but I was trying to think of a new series since okay. you were saying not just old but also possibly new stuff. We've even been watching at night lately. We're about to wrap up watching the first season of a show called House of Lies, which is basically about a bunch of terrible, horrible, awful people that are financial consultants. And it's actually based on a book called House of Lies by a guy who I think used to work for Booz Allen Hamilton. So it gets into a lot of just kind of the, the shady dealings. And a lot of, I mean, it's played more on the, the comedy angle but in a lot of ways, you're watching it just like you'll kind of watch House of Cards and go, well, I maybe don't necessarily believe that, you know, congressmen are out whacking dudes in parking garages exactly. But 
again, just as we've discussed throughout this whole conversation, there are elements of truth in there. And hopefully that's the thing with a little bit of research and a little bit of extra analysis that can kind of hopefully bring that that context and subtext. Jay Dyer, thanks so much for coming on Navigating Netflix. See, it doesn't even roll off my tongue anymore. We'll have to change the title. (laughs) Uh, Assessing Amazon Prime. Uh, What was... Oh, damn, my buddy Mike had one. Contemplating Cinema. Um, But then that doesn't include television. uh, How about uh, in the show notes and in the comments, we'll implore people to leave ridiculous and or good ideas for possible name change for this episode where we look at shows and films that are worth watching and thinking and talking about thoughtfully jay's analysis uh, blockbuster video that is available (laughs) 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 we, we we might be able to work with that jay buddy thanks so much for spending time with us man i appreciate it thank you james